Howdy, everybody. Uh, my name is Jared. Uh, this is my ShareBrain channel, and I thought I would do a little experiment and just casually work on taking apart some old stuff and some new stuff. Um, and maybe people like to hang out and talk about it and see what I'm doing and interject, whatever. So let's go for it. Uh, first of all, um, I haven't figured out quite the right order to do all this stuff in, but I'm thinking uh, the Compact Portable 3 I'm going to save until the end because that's part of a larger kind of disassembly, reassembly project. I'm going to need to clean it a bunch. So um, it's going to make a big mess, and I don't want to have to clean that up on stream uh, to get to the next thing that I want to do. So um, let's put that to the end and maybe start with the IBM 5140 portable. So let me pull that out here. Uh, you might want to be able to see what I'm doing here. Let's see. Other way around. Nope. It's been a while. I've kind of forgotten how to do this. <laughs> there we go. Okay, cool. Oh, and right on cue, uh, we've got a thunderstorm brewing outside. So if you hear a lot of weird crackling, that's what's going on. Uh, so yeah, this is uh, something I got last weekend from uh, a local computer nerd, Sean. He, uh, he does the Commodore Computer Club here in the Portland, Vancouver area in the kind of northwest corner of Oregon, or in the case of Vancouver, the southwest corner of Washington uh, in the United States. Well, we're all on the West Coast here. And he had a whole bunch of stuff that he had rescued from um, somebody who'd passed away and had collected a whole bunch of stuff. Um, and the people who were, you know, the family wanted to get this stuff out of the, out of the way because they, they didn't really care about it that much and managed to find Sean, who he and, and I think somebody else in the computer club packed out all this stuff, just a massive amount of stuff. And I visited, visited the storage space that they were keeping all this stuff in last weekend and saw a few interesting things that I thought I might like to play with. So um, the first thing here is the IBM 5140. Uh, this was a portable computer that IBM made in, I think, 86 or 87. And it's basically sort of a original flavor IBM PC. It's not a 286, it's nothing fancy. It's slow, slow, slow. Um, but for the time, it was an amazingly compact computer. Um, a lot of the other portable computers of the time were really chunky. So uh, let's open it up here. Uh, the handle here slides out, which is kind of cool. It's a little, little wonky, <laughs> um, but it works. And then there are these little buttons. I don't know if you can see them. Um, little button down here, one on each side, and you have to press those to get this to flip up. And upsy daisy, there we go. So it's got a monochrome LCD panel. Uh, I don't think even think it's backlit. Although I read something about um, like one version of this model had some sort of a backlight in it. But this one, as far as I can tell, does not. The display, I think, is 80 characters by 25, but it's super stretched out, as you can tell. It's a very wide screen, so everything, the aspect ratio of the stuff that you put on the screen is completely screwed up. Uh, it's got two three and a half inch floppies, which were, um, you know, just sort of coming into fashion at that point, and a pretty nice keyboard. IBM's definitely known for their keyboards. Um, so the first thing I did when I got these things, of course, is figure out where the battery is because it's a portable that actually has a battery inside, unlike some of the other portables of the era, like, um, you know, a K-Pro or uh, an Osborne. I guess those were a few years earlier than this one, but, you know, th this one, it's a known fact it's got a battery. And of course, with batteries, you always have to worry about after 35 years that if they've leaked. So... The battery is stored in the back here, but we've got this extra bit on here too, which it turns out is how you expand the system. They sell a whole bunch of, or sold, <laughs> not anymore, uh, they sold a whole bunch of these little add-on blocks that you just kind of stuff on the back 
and they plug in through a connector here that, so they, they basically stack onto this bus. So they all get access to this bus by having a, a, a connector that plugs in and then extends out the other side of each module. So that's pretty cool. Um, don't have to open up the computer to expand it. But this is in the way uh, because the battery's behind it. So there is a button on one side here. Yeah, this, this button here. You press that and it unlatches and the connector comes out and then you've got one of these modules. Uh, this particular one, let's see, what's the connector on the other side here? Oh yeah, so that's, um, that's a video output. So it's composite and then I think there's a couple of other sort of IBM custom weird connectors that are on this side. Um, so yeah, interesting way to add on video output, definitely. But then the uh, battery is stored in this panel down here. And fortunately, somebody had the forethought to take care of the battery already. You see, there's no battery in there. And in fact, they were so thoughtful that they clipped the connector and the wire from the battery and, and taped it in here so that in the future, if somebody wanted to put a battery in here, replacement battery, they'd have the connector and the wire to do it because the, the connector plugs in here. So very, very kind of them. Uh, curious to know who, who did that, whether it was the person who owned these just before me or if this has passed through a whole bunch of people's hands, don't know. Um, so yeah, now I, I actually got two of these. We're looking at the sort of cleaner of the two. And where's, yeah. So the, uh, the dirtier of the two, I pulled out this. And this is not an original IBM battery pack. This is somebody who bought a bunch of cells. And in fact, if you look carefully, you can see there's the DigiKey uh, label on the battery. I think the label's dated something like 1999. So they've been using these labels for 20 something years now. But I've read in um, online that it was fairly common for people who wanted to continue to use these things. Oh, I've got some battery acid on my finger, cool. I thought putting this in a bag was gonna take care of that. Oh well. So yeah, apparently it was popular to buy a bunch of cells and then just literally tape them together, as you can see, um, and call it a battery pack. <laughs> so yeah, this this super gross battery pack. Mm -mm -mm -mm. So yeah, that was fun. Um, remarkably on the other ma machine, the uh, battery compartment itself wasn't all that corroded. There were just a few little flecks of um, battery crud. Okay, so I would like to get in here and figure out what the system is, because it, apparently it's, um, it's expandable. So I think at the base it came with like 256K of RAM, um, but then you could add modules and get additional RAM. So I'm kind of curious to get in here and see what, if any, expansion RAM stuff is in here. Um, getting in, I guess, is kind of a trick. Um, I honestly haven't read past the part where you get the keyboard out. So that was the thing that was holding me up and I decided I should do a stream about it. So I, I kind of just stopped there. But you have to open up the lid and then to get the keyboard back and to get access to the tray that the logic board is in, you need to, you need to pull the keyboard out. And apparently the instructions tell you to use dimes. So one dime, two dimes. And just kind of, I guess, stick them in and somehow undo. I really don't want to break any of the plastic, but I'm not sure. It, it feels like it's hitting something and it can either go under or, this is really dodgy. <laughs> This feels super sketchy. Let me turn it around so it's a little bit more visible without breaking the screen off. Okay, so yeah, in the slot here, insert a dime. Oh. <laughs> I don't like this setup at all. I'm just sure I'm going to break something. So this is supposed to lift up at the back after whatever little retention tab gets pushed out of the way. 
Oof. Okay, I'm gonna try this one more time and see if, come on. Okay, maybe it's time to go over to the computer and look for some better instructions because <laughs> this isn't working. Um, yeah, so I've got some stuff here. Let's see. What I found that was most helpful was somebody had a YouTube video about getting into these things. So let's just look for IBM 5140. And I think it was a, a video about the RAM expansion stuff. So hardware overview, no. No, no, no. No, no, no. Typing sounds, ASMR for... That's hilarious. I mean, it's a nice sound. So much stuff on here. What's funny is I hadn't really known that this even existed until I saw it last week. Um, just wasn't really a thing. I, I guess it wasn't a very popular computer uh, because it, it was kind of underpowered by modern standards. You know, everyone else was coming out with 286 base systems and then they come out with this lowly 8088 base system and people just kind of shrugged, I guess. So maybe that's why I hadn't heard of it. It's just that um, it just wasn't very popular. <laughs> so I'm not finding the video I saw earlier, which is a little odd. Power board repair. Well, do you suppose, let me open this in a new tab and then just try a little bit more to find that original video. Boxy, no. Maybe another video where they open it up. This is odd because I found the video last time, like top of my search results. I don't know what I'm asking differently this time. Maybe RAM upgrade. Uh, did I spell it right? I can't see. I did. Okay. Oh, it's right there. Yep. And hey, we get to watch it an ad. Hopefully that's the audio is not going out. Yeah, it's not going out. Good. So you don't have to listen to the damn ad. Okay, so here we are. Uh, let me get this a little bit larger. And yeah, so here's the instructions. Yeah, and you can see right there, they're showing stuff a coin in there. Oh, so I, I guess it comes in underneath whatever thing I need to push on. So, uh, switch back to the table. There we are. Uh, I mean, I see it kind of working. Kind of. The keyboard just kind of hops and then it and then the coin slips off of it. So, oh, well, uh, okay. <laughs> and it fell back in. Oh, thanks, IBM. Okay, so that is out, that side. And I guess I have to do the same magic over here. Come on. Uh, maybe it'd help if I was lifting up as well. Hey, victory. And I don't think I even broke anything. I'm feeling really clumsy today though. Okay, and I know there's a ribbon. Yep, there's a ribbon. Ooh, this thing looks like it's been maxed out. Uh, let me get the keyboard detached. How do I do that? Not on the keyboard side. Okay, so the keyboard, the ribbon goes back, back here. And, uh, I guess it pulls up. Let's see. I guess I'm, I need to recenter myself here. 
and maybe a plastic spudger would be a good idea right now. Something fairly gentle. Okay, so. Mm, I know, we have that document I was just looking at. Why don't we look at that? There's probably... Um, see this, this guy, how he goes about this. I wish I had a copy of this, these instructions. That would be really nice. It might be online, but I poked around a little bit and didn't find him. It's, it's probably buried in some 1200 page document from IBM. Okay, here we go. No, no, no. Okay, so they just lift the screen straight, or uh, lift the keyboard straight up, which I guess is a good way to get it out of the way, especially since it was designed to stack into the display. And then I'm just gonna kind of, oh, I should switch back to the table. There we go, sorry. Just get in here and pull up. Oh yeah, piece of cake, okay. Yeah, so this connector has got little kind of, yeah, you see this? It's got a little um, bit sticking out here that you can catch with your finger and it pulls the connector out really nicely. Oh, I do have an overhead view. I should use that more often. Yeah, there we go. So here you're seeing, let me clean up a little bit here. Do, 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 do. Get, get my change out of the way. Everything's upside down for me. And I guess for you too. <laughs> I wonder if there's a way in my video software to flip the, uh, the picture that I'm looking at. Because that would make life a lot easier than having to think backwards all the time. Yeah, okay, so um, what we've got here is four, and I think each of these is 128K uh, SRAM memory expansion. So they're not DRAM. The, the really interesting thing about this system is it's a, an early example of suspending a computer where when you turn it back on or resume it, it comes back right to where it was. And in this case, the trick was that they used a CMOS version of the 8088, which can effectively be clocked at zero, um, just sort of suspended um, so, you know, you don't clock it, it just sits there in its current state. Uh, and then SRAM has the benefit of retaining information without having to be refreshed all the time, like dynamic RAM does, you know, all the RAM that we use now, more or less. So by simply stopping the clock on the computer, everything grinds to a halt, but nothing is lost, which was a very simple way to solve this problem. Now, I know there are other computers like... Um, I remember the Tandy Model 100 using that trick several years earlier, I think probably like 83, I don't know. I'm not really good with dates. Um, yeah, so we've got 512K and then I think there's another 128K on the base, the, the logic board back there. Let's see if I can tip this up and you can see in there. Not particularly. It's kind of dark. Well, I guess we'll just have to take it apart then, right? Okay, so the memory modules, I think all they do is just kind of tip up and pull out. They're, they're stacked by these connectors here. So I'm going to... Mm, ah, there's little tabs that they, they get caught on. Do I want to do this? I mean, it looks really clean. I don't need to clean it. There's always a little bit of fear in messing with tabs like this that they're just going to break off. So, um, and this is, I think, yeah, I think this is cast plastic, not not metal. This does not feel like aluminum, and it would be a much heavier computer if it were, I suppose, even aluminum. So, is there a way I can kind of put a little bit of pressure on here and then just kind of Gently, mm, I'm uncomfortable with this. 
And there's another tab over here. Oh. Oh, the board moves around. So I might be able to just sort of twist the board out um, from out from under the tab a little bit so I don't have to bend the tab as far. This is tricky to do without blocking your view. Hey, I got a zoom. Could, uh, zoom in here. Or I guess I am zoomed in all the way. Hmm. Maybe I'll change lenses. Hey, this is a live stream, right? It's not supposed to be super tight and compact. So changing lenses is totally par for the course. Okay. So this is going to look weird, I'm sure. Off we go. And put the cap on. Just put that there. And this lens may be overkill for this purpose, though. Focus up. No, it's not too bad. But we can go, I think, a whole lot closer, too. I can just remember how to control it. Whoa. Mm, that's not good. Trying to figure out where it can focus. Nope. I really need to read the documentation on this lens. I don't understand how it works. Okay, well, the other solution is to bring the camera down. So now it's much closer and up. Well, still not as close as I was hoping, but I can scrooge this over at least and then try going at this again. Okay, so. Ee. Yeah, you can't really see the tab on the video. It's behind the floppy drive. Oh, man. Okay, is there another way I should be doing this? Usually when things are hard, that means I'm doing it wrong. Now, and if you look over here, I don't think the logic board's going to come out. And so this is a little extension of the logic board here. So right, right here, this is a little sort of tongue of the logic board all the way back underneath the rest of the computer. It comes to this connector here in this first board of SRAM. So I don't think I'll be able to remove the logic board until I figure out how to get these things out. So I'm going to try battling this a little bit more here. I wonder what the other view looks like. Not that one. This one. Yeah, that's not too good. Okay. So shove this away. Mm. Well, hang on. <laughs> I don't see anyone screaming in chat yet, but I just made the observation that um, in order to get this board out, the connector, of course, has to pull out this way, right? And these tabs don't really block my doing that. There is this little bit of plastic here which is going to interfere, but if I just lift up, maybe I can come over it and push on this board and kind of get it out despite the tabs. Uh, nope. Well, it seemed like a good plan at the time. Uh, can can y'all see well enough to even know what I'm fighting with? Like, 
if anybody's got any clever ideas, uh, I'm into hearing them. Oh, also, how's the audio? Um, I'm using a different mic here. You can see this little wireless mic. I figured it would be a whole lot easier logistically than trying to speak into the boom microphone. Oh, cool. I, I guess that's John, the PDX hackerspace. Good to see you. Whoop. So, yeah. Whoop. <laughs> okay. I don't want to, I don't like breaking old plastic. It just feels very crude, but oh, I got it. I just have to be not gentle. And then this one's going to be sprung. It's going to want to come out because there's tension from the other side of the board. And I'll just be more aggressive, I guess. Mm, come on. And that, oh, I thought that was the sound of plastic breaking, but it wasn't. <laughs> I don't know what that sound was other than just nasty. But yeah, the tab is still intact. And doo -doo 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 -doo, we have our first uh, SRAM module free. Get that in the center here. Yeah. Focus, focus. Yeah, so it's got six SRAM chips on here and then another, uh, t okay, so 16 all together. Hey, that's a nice, it's a nice computery number. They must be, I need to take a closer look here. Um, 2064, don't know off the top of the head, off, off the top of my head what size that would be. But um, what's interesting is they've got looks to be a custom IC here. Uh, let me get this up a lot closer. Come on, focus. There we go. Yeah, th this camera, it's a DSLR. It was not designed for doing HDMI anything. So whenever I do anything with it, you get menu stuff on the screen. Uh, and of course, you probably also notice there's a little bit of a battery indicator in the corner. I <laughs> uh, can't get rid of that either which is a bit of a bummer, but hey, I've cobbled this whole streaming setup from basically a whole bunch of cameras I had laying around over the last 12, 13 years, uh, including this face cam, which uh, went to tour camp in 2009 and survived the uh, volcanic dust of tour camp that first year. But yeah, it's an ancient video camera by modern standards. Oh, hi, Melinda. So yeah, I guess uh, we need to keep pulling these out in order to get the logic board free. Because, uh, as I mentioned earlier, this guy is firmly attached. And unless I unstack all of these, I can't unseat this connector and then pull the logic board out and have a look at it. So I will continue on here, being a little bit more confident in how I'm dealing with the plastics. Still don't like it. It just feels like I'm going to break something and I probably will. Uh, Got it. I also wish there was a better tool for this. Um, it feels like just having something sort of, sort of like a reverse pliers that I'm sure there's a tool that is designed to spread. Why do I feel like it might be called a spreader? Um, I don't have one of those. I don't know what one of those looks like. I don't know where to get one or how it would work or even if it would work in this case. But it seems like something like that would be ideal here to be able to put a very controlled amount of force on a little tab of plastic and push it away ever so carefully. So yeah, we got our second one free here. Ta-da! Same, same deal. Another 128K. And now the third one. Do not like. 
Do not like. Yes, got it. So the reason I'm extra cringing, of course, you know, first of all, it's an old computer and I don't want to break it, but plastics tend to get brittle with age, which means they break more easily. And it's sometimes it, it gets so brittle that you just simply can't do what you need to do to take something apart without breaking something because the plastic is too inflexible to bend in a circumstance like this and it just breaks. Um, it seems like we're not there yet. I'm getting away with this so far and I'm very happy about it, but it feels really dodgy. It'd be nice if they just allowed you to screw them in or something, but I guess they were thinking they were gonna be clever and not require tools. Okay, so the bay is now empty. Uh, let me switch back over to the table here. We got our stack of RAM. I'll move, I don't know, over here. And then figure out how to get in the back side. Um, there's nothing obvious on the front here. Oh, um, at some point, I think these floppy drives are going to have to come out. So there are two screws on each floppy drive. And I think they just pull out. Not sure. But we can see, or we can cheat and look at the, the video from <laughs> the other person. Let's just give it a try. So I'm going to back these out. And then, yep, look at that. Just pulls right out. Ta-da! There we go. Uh, I imagine IBM did this because they love serviceability and being able to just, you know, pull something out and plop it back in without causing too much trouble to the customer. I mean, I'm sure they build the customer plenty, but being able to quickly go and, and fix a problem definitely has an appeal to a manufacturer. So yeah, there's one and the other. And there's the other drive. I'm uh, posing for the overhead camera here. So yeah. Ugh, gotta think backwards. Uh, who made this? Alps, okay. Yeah, cool. Do, do, do. That looks really weird inside. It looks like there's something bent. Uh, I wonder if this thing will actually take a floppy. Let me go grab a floppy really quickly and see if it inserts there, because that looks bendy, doesn't it? Like there's something... Eh, no, I guess it's I guess it's fine. Well, I have a floppy. It's easy to do. Uh, oh, do I have floppies? I have so many floppies. I, I've been collecting disks um, primarily to, to archive them, because, I don't know, there's, it feels like there's a lot of software, especially for more obscure computers, that just seems to be disappearing. And it'd be nice to get an archive copy of it and upload it to archive.org so that if somebody's got some weird computer for which software is rare, um, they can find the software to run on it. So, yeah, let me go table here. And, yep, floppy does fit just fine. No problem. Uh, I have no idea if these drives have to be kept track of. Like I have to put the one that was on the left side back in the left slot and the one on the right side back in the right slot. I would think not, but I should probably um, keep track of that just in case. Okay, so now um, let me zoom this camera in a little bit. You can kind of see what's going on in there. Um, that's well, let's think that's that chip there is yep, my arm is in the way. That chip right there is probably a custom chip that IBM did. Because I think two 
well, this has got an 8088 in it, so it's going to be a much smaller chip. It's going to be 40-ish pins. Uh, so that's probably a very custom chip. And then over here, we see what's probably the BIOS EEPROMs, so these two guys. And then a couple of other really big PLCCs. But let's figure out how to get in here so we can really get a good look at it. Um, oh, while we're on this side, there is this connector here, which goes to the speaker, which is right there. And then it goes back to the board. And it looks like I can just pull that out and try to do it in a way that doesn't block the camera. I don't think that's possible. Okay, screw it. Here we go. Arf. Oh, they had a little bit of um, adhesive on the bottom of it. So, yeah, you can see this blob of tape. That was kind of holding it in. But it came out. Oh, and it's an edge connector. See that? So it just slides on the edge of the board. I wonder if they did that for cost reasons. I mean, normally in PCs, even I think of that era, you would have like a 0.1 inch header and it would just plug in on the top. But this is a way for them to avoid one more connector, I guess. I don't know. Um, seems, seems a little odd. Anyhow, um, I think we can slide this back down. Oh, here's a cool thing. Um, zoom back out. We should probably take the, the screen off, right? Because it's in the way. Yes, you can take the screen off. So check this out. You push down here. Um, and let's look overhead as well. It's kind of blocked. Come on, focus up. I don't understand the focus on this thing either. Okay. And angle sucks on this. Let me tip it up a bit more. Oh, that's my leg. Wrong way. Um, tip it down again. Yeah, well, I don't know, I may be trying too hard. Let's go back here and I'll just get this closer and get it at an angle and zoom in. So that is essentially a latch. And the purpose of the latch, check this out, is so you can do that. So I, I guess it's convertible with the idea that you would dock this or slide it in underneath um, underneath like a monitor and plug it in using the, the module that I disconnected earlier that's basically a you know external video output. And then you would use it that way and when it came time to go portable again, you just plug this thing back in again, which seems clever enough. But Taking it off also means it's a little bit easier to work on. So let me put this out of the way too. And let's go around the back side because that's about the only way I can see to pull this board out. Uh, and I'm a little bit afraid that I'm seeing some adhesive around here. Slide this. Yeah. So there's some goo underneath this connector. You're not going to focus? You can't focus that close? Come on. Really? Learn all sorts of interesting things about your camera. You can't do that, huh? Wild. Okay, well, I'll zoom out a little bit and it should clear up. Yeah. So yeah, there's this odd, what looks like adhesive, and I'm a little bit afraid that means this board's not going to cooperate when I want to pull it out. But let's turn around the other side. I think it pulls out the back and see what we can do. Do, 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 do. Good enough. Okay, get the battery door off here. And yeah, we got four screws here. 
And so the, these screws are holding interesting little metal brackets that they've got. Um, let's look a little bit closer at these. Industrial design is fun. So there are these little curved hook deals on these brackets on both sides. So you see that it's basically the same on both. And the way these modules work is they, they have little hooks on them. Uh, well, wait, wait, not on that side. On this side, yes. So those slot in underneath and catch the, um, the hooks on the other side. And this pivots back onto the back of the computer. And then this side, I guess, is a latch. Yeah, it's a latch where you see how those are kind of, these kind of jut out to the right there. And if you push them back, they move out of the way of the latch, the hook on the other side. And that is what releases them. So kind of cool, pretty simple. Anyway, let's get these screws out. Important to make zoom noises. Okay. And I think these might actually be the same on both sides, which is convenient, I guess, for their manufacturing. They only have to build one, twice as many of one part instead of half as many of two parts. Although for what IBM charged for hardware back in the day, I don't know that they were sweating that kind of thing too much. Oh, you bastards. This right here, that is a little bit of plastic that gets melted during assembly and I guess retains, or is that an alignment peg? I guess I should actually try to pull it off, but I'm pretty sure this little plastic bit here is gonna block me from pulling this off. Yeah. So this, when, it, when the, this plastic piece was cast, there was a little plastic peg that stuck out here and then they melted it and pushed it, kind of splashed, splatted it, puddled it, mushroomed it. I don't know what the right word is here, but that is retaining this bit even without the screws. However, I just noticed this entire piece of plastic, now that the screws are out, is moving. So maybe I don't have to pull this off because this bracket, now that the screws are out, isn't really doing anything structurally. Sometimes I don't stop and think about what I'm doing. And if I had, it would be clearly <laughs> very obvious that removing these two screws is what I really wanted to do and that trying to pull this off was not what I wanted to do. Um, yeah, I'm learning. Okay, so now I'll do this side. And I think this whole bit will come right off, this whole plastic piece. When I was looking at the uh, Twitch tags, I guess they're called tags, um, for how to tag my stream, it turns out there's some kind of visual a ASMR thing too now that's you can do. I don't know if working on retro computers is ASMR, but I don't know, looking at this chonky old stuff is fun visually. And I suppose it, it also has kind of a unique sound. Things, things that you work on these days aren't built the same way out of the same thick, thick plastic, enormous pieces. So yeah, that came off. Let me um, zoom out. And yeah, so it fit on just like, no, not just like that, more or less like that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But then it just kind of pivots off. And there we go. It's a piece of cast plastic and it's covering up what looks to be the power supply. So, yeah. Um, do, 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 do. Power comes in this side. So this is, this is the power input. It's a barrel plug uh, or barrel jack, sorry. And then this is the power button, big, Nice big red button. If there was any doubt what it did, it's red, so it must be power. 
And I think maybe this board just kind of pulls out, pulls up. Let's try that and see what happens. Yep. Uh, oh, wow. Okay. Yeah. Okay. There we go. This is, this is easy. So yeah, there we go. Um, definitely the power supply. And since it takes in a DC voltage through the power jack over here, there's really not as much to it. It's all much smaller, lower voltage electronics than your typical old PC power supply. So um, it's mostly just regulation, turning whatever voltage goes in here into plus and minus 12 and plus five and maybe minus five. Maybe, maybe minus 12 isn't, isn't required either. Um, as, as time went on, some of those voltage rails weren't necessary anymore. I think partly because um, dynamic RAMs had fewer voltage rail requirements um, as of like, I don't know, 83 or 84, I think you could run them just off of five volts. But before that, a lot of times they needed plus 12 and plus five and minus something. I don't remember if it was five or 12, but yeah, this is pretty simple and lightweight as far as it goes, but that's because all the AC to DC conversion was in a separate brick and I don't have that brick. Um, so I need to do some research and figure out what power um, this requires, what voltage, what current. It's probably going to be at least 12 volts and then a few amps. I may even have a brick around here that'll do the job, but I'm not going to go looking for it quite yet. So let's put this aside. And what do we got here? Um, this looks like the back side of the connectors for the floppy drives. And those just go straight down onto the logic board. And is it even possible to pull out the logic board? Oh, I see. So this top plastic piece pivots around. Um, let me zoom in here. Yeah, it, this is basically a pivot. And if I could remember how to lower this again, then we could see it pivot. What's the, what was the catch? Oh, I don't remember. Yeah, how did this go back down again? <laughs> Pull the lid up and that, oh, I see. It probably involves this rotating. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, you can't see what I'm doing. Let me let me fix that. I try not to break things in the process. Okay. So zoom out. So yeah, this pivots when the display when you tip the display down in order to fold it closed. And I think that if I pull this down, the whole thing lowers. Yeah. So there we go. Um, and <laughs> If I had done that while we were watching here, we would have seen this whole thing pivot in this little sort of cradle on this bit of plastic here. So that makes sense. But how do I remove this if I want to just get at the logic board? So back up again. Erp. Oh. I'm seeing stuff in chat. Oh, Retro 80s Tech Show collection that used to be a channel on Twitch, but I can't seem to find it anymore. Um, was it the front handle outdated? Okay, so the comments are just outdated. I'll, I should disregard, I guess. I'm, I'm really bad at Twitch. I don't, I actually don't, kind of don't want to host content there. It just seems like a good way to do chat. Although I guess YouTube for how I'm using Twitch is probably also a good choice at this point. But um, I guess if you don't extract portions of your content into clips, they don't get saved past a week or two. So if you look, I, there's none of the stuff I've done is preserved on Twitch. So I, I'm recording it and then I upload it to YouTube for posterity. Because, you know, when the world comes to an end, we need to know how to fix our retro computers, because they'll be the only ones that work, right? Um, uh huh. So how do I get in there? It seems like, oh, 
I wonder if just pushing in on the sides or in here, like if I suppose if I were designing this and I'm not an industrial designer, I would have some sort of retention along the sides here that would keep this thing from popping out too far. But as I pull up here, it feels like what's holding it back is here. So uh, what <laughs> when I lift up, what doesn't bend? Or what doesn't want to bend? I can't tell. Um, and at this point, I've asked myself once more, am I trying too hard? First of all, this thing I thought was adhesive down here, this sort of yellow-orange stuff, it's not adhesive. This is not stuck. So that probably means getting this board out is easier than I thought. There are, however, a whole bunch of these blasted tabs all around. Um, there's one in this corner, and... Okay, well, I guess I misspoke by saying there were a whole bunch of them. There's one. I suppose if I can convince this one tab... Let me turn the other way. This guy over here... Zoom in. Hope none of you are watching this on some enormous screen where zooming is disorienting. Um, so right there, it's a little little tab here that is holding the board down, and I'm going to see if I can't get it to relinquish the board to me, because I wouldn't mind being able to just sort of look at the board in nice detail with the camera. So one thing I'm noticing is because I'm right-handed, I always want to do this, and that blocks the camera. Maybe I need to flip around my setup so the camera's on my left side instead of my right side, which pretty much means rearranging my entire desk, which I can do. Um, it just doesn't sound like fun right now. So let's get in here and pull, 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 pull. And see if no, oh, that's not a bad sound. <laughs> did not break. It certainly sounded like it did. Ah 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 ah. Yeah, you can't see that, can you? Wah! Got it. Okay. So now it's up on that corner, but I think we're still stuck on some other spot. Okay. This this is premature. I just noticed these. Uh, columns here that support this whole top piece. The board <laughs> is basically, it's got a hole in the middle of it, I think all the way around, which means that this ha board has to lift up and around and out past these columns, I think, which means this is premature. I'll just snap that back in and look for a plan B. I'm almost sure this needs to come off, but I'm having a hard time figuring out how. Are there screws maybe on top? I was thinking maybe there might be screws hidden in here. Do, do, do. Uh, no, no. There's not. Ugh. Back to the table. Monitor connected via ribbon that can be disconnected. You mean the, the LCD panel? Or do you mean the connector here? Bottom shell seems to be clipped in. Um, are you talking about around here? Uh, this is not a good framing. Yeah, so you're talking about around here. I think this is purely the guide for the handle. So that's for this bit, um, which I don't think has to come out to get this top piece off. Pretty sure there's just something retaining here. Why don't we look at the backside again? 
Okay, there are a few screws on this plastic bit, which is basically the battery uh, housing. Uh, through columns from the bottom, bottom shell seems to be clipped in, the white part coming off, the gray part on the bottom to get the screws on the bottom. Uh, no screws on the bottom bottom, maybe you mean a different bottom. Um, okay, so peeping this a little bit more, there's a couple screws here which hold this whole plastic tray on. And this plastic tray is uh, I can't figure out how it relates to the top lid. I see the outside plastic hinges, but is there another set of hinges on the top of the battery box? There may, and that's I was kind of trying to by looking inside trying to figure out if this whole assembly was somehow attached or clipped, retained by the battery tray, and that maybe taking the screws on the battery tray out would do the job. So why don't we do that? Um, my pile of screws is getting a little messy here. Fortunately, this is a fairly easy computer to take apart, which is definitely not the case with the uh, Compact Portable 3. <laughs> that thing is a freaking nightmare. I, whatever they charged for, it had to be like half labor just to put one of those things together. Um, Compaq, while they were a very successful company, clearly didn't spend a lot of time thinking about manufacturability. Um, or at least not the kind of manufacturability I, <laughs> I identify as being economical. Um, especially looking at the backside, this does not support my theory. Um, well, I'm okay. So I'm gonna, there's three screws here. I'm going to pull these out and we'll see what happens. Um, get this framed up a little bit better so you all can see if anything interesting happens. Those are different screws than the four black screws I took out earlier. I'm absolutely paranoid about putting the wrong screws back and putting the wrong screws back uh, because I've had, I haven't done this in a long time because I got paranoid about this a long time ago, but I remember a long time ago taking something apart and then putting in the wrong screw and it was too long and it busted right through the top of the case. And of course, now I have a screw sticking out of the case, which is really awesome. And there's some computers like the uh, uh, Tandy Radio Shack TRS-80 Model 1. Oh, wait a minute. I think the Model 2? The color computer, Model 1 and Model 2. I think both have that same problem where you take out like four or six screws and there are different lengths for each pair of them that you take out. And if you don't put them back in the right order, they go right up through the top, through the front of the case, you know, basically out next to the keyboard. And it is not pretty. Uh, one way I've been addressing this, at least for machine screws, although machine screws aren't likely to go busting through the case, is to take my calipers. Um, where are my calipers? Yes. Take my calipers. And I also have some cool thread gauges. Uh, this one's metric, so for IBM probably doesn't come in handy, or at least IBM in the 80s. I don't know if maybe they got with the metric later on, but here's an imperial uh, screw gauge as well. And then I've also got this thing, which is um, it's pretty cool. It folds out a whole bunch of different, if I can get it in, get into it and pull it out. Uh, it folds out a whole bunch of these little thread gauges and you just push it into, oops, sorry, you can't see that. Let's go overhead. Yeah, so thinking backwards again, focus, focus, yeah. You can see all these different thread pitches and you can just push these against the shaft of the screw and identify what the screw pitch is or the thread pitch. And so I just, for especially for computers that are more complicated than this thing, um, I document each screw I take out. I take a picture of the computer at the current state of disassembly, and I mark out, like, here are all the screws that I'm taking out, and then I record 
their length and the shape of the head and all this stuff. And then I even, if I'm going to be really fancy, try to find McMaster car part uh, part numbers for them so that I can put them online. And if people have got computers that don't, uh, that are missing some screws, they can go to McMaster car and buy replacements or with the thread pitch and length and, and all these other specifications can use that information to go shop wherever they, wherever they can get screws and buy them. Cause I've been frustrated by having computers that like, I don't have the screw and I don't know what the thread pitch is. And so I can't really replace it. Um, but if somebody had measured that and written it down and posted it somewhere, then I could buy a replacement screw. Now, you, you could, with some experimentation, usually figure out what screw goes in a hole. Um, but it'd be nicer if it was just documented, right? Anyway, so I've kept you all in suspense long enough. What will this battery tray do? It seems to be caught on a plastic tab in here, but it looks like it's barely caught. So I should be able to just kind of bend it a little bit and yeah, it pops. And now the whole thing's kind of hopping. It feels like there's still something. There, there is that tab that I had released earlier on the other side. Maybe I need to go back and do that. But I think we might be onto something here. It'd be kind of a bummer if the top piece and this didn't detach from the logic board, but I can't imagine that being the case. So let's go around here again. And... I really hate bending old plastic like this. I need a second spudger to get underneath the board. Um, just buy all the screws. <laughs> you, I would be interested to know how many different skews of screws, skews of screws, McMaster car has. It's got to be in the hundreds of thousands with all the different finishes and metric and imperial and blah, 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 blah. It's just redonk. So that's lifted up. That's loose. We still seem to be stuck on something here. Uh, oh, there is this bit here, which um, if you can see the edge of this board here is caught on there. And that kind of suggests to me, like this is not a retention tab. This is more like a slot where they're expecting you to pull it out this direction. And I don't know how to do that because this thing's still, still in there. Um, okay, zoom back out. And keep looking. I, I've been avoiding leaning into the shot, but at some point, I really need to see what I'm doing here, and without leaning in, I can't. So, um, what am I missing? I really don't see any other screws, and certainly not any other screws that wouldn't be underneath here. So, so what? Uh, what about the gray tabs on the side? Remove the insert. So th you're saying this thing here? Because I guess this is part of this plastic, isn't it? Um, hmm. Okay. Let's go overhead. Um, so yeah, it's this bit here. And... You know, I don't really see... Well, okay. So there are... You probably can't see them here. I should go back to this view. Zoom in a bit. There are these three tabs here, which are what seem to be holding this in place. So let me push these back without getting in the way of the camera and see if I can't convince Maybe I'll go with the pokey end. Oof, that doesn't feel good. I think I just smashed my pokey end. My pokey end's no longer pokey. Okay, back to this end. 
Uh, this does not feel good. And I just stabbed myself with the pokey end, which, while not all that pokey anymore, is pokey enough to hurt. So, yeah, it's, it's not cooperating. Okay, I'm going to bend in, bend over this and see. Uh, I don't know. I didn't expect this thing to fight me so much. We're, what, over an hour in at this point? <laughs> and there's other fun things to take apart. Um, I don't know, I still feel like we're really close, and that's what's annoying about this, is that there's probably just one simple thing I'm not seeing, and it'll all come apart. Because I suspect that they aren't, aren't requiring this to be removed just to get this board out. That seems really bad from a maintainability standpoint. Like, you're just going to break... You're just going to break this plastic, um, especially if you're a ham-fisted repair person. Um, so, yeah, it seems it somehow just seems unlikely. I'm going to keep looking a little bit more here. We could also go bounce back to that video and see if they have any magic. Did I get all the screws? I did. I mean, this... Okay, what is still hanging up here? Maybe zoom out a little bit here. Mm. Now the bottom case is starting to bend. You see that? So it's still... Something's still holding on. I wonder if I can see if I look down here. Yeah. Yeah. What is that? What is... Oh. If I... Oh, those are the the, um, the posts, the pillars. So remember, there's, there's the two pillars over here. These two guys. They are still holding on mightily. Um, oh, wait, wait. Uh, I didn't expect this to move like this. Okay. Ah, what? That was not a bad click, I promise. Or I'm pretty sure. Um, something just let go. Like, I was just being too gentle? I don't know. I don't think I broke anything. I just heard a kind of a gentle mechanical click, almost like some fairly mild retaining um, clip of some sort. So now it looks like the only things that are holding on really are the um, floppy drive cables. So you can see them back there. There's the one here, and then the one here. And if I push from the back, what happens? Are they just kind of posted in? I guess I guess maybe they just pull out of the sockets here. It looks like it looks like 40 pin sockets. These cables just terminate in 40 pin sockets. Very strange. Oh, I have to be careful not to pull too hard. This is still attached. And it looks like they've got some kind of mashed plastic posts here as well. So I don't think they are expecting me to pull that out. Uh, I don't know. I mean, does the board, whole board come out at this point? It's still... still attached to something. But what? Ugh. It 
there's some plastic bits in there. What happens if I... No, it's the floppy. I still need to get the floppy connectors undone, I guess. <clears throat> so this is somehow pushed... Okay, so it's... This floppy ribbon cable is loose, but... Which suggests it might pull out in some way. Oh, there are spring clips, or um, I guess it's just sort of the shape of this, these posts on the left and the right, that if you pull on them a little bit on the sides, this just sort of drops out. Same thing over here, where uh, if I pull this out, Then on each side, yeah. Oof, okay. So yeah, now this is only attached here, <clears throat> and it seems they don't want me to detach it from the logic board. Let me zoom out a little bit so you can see the whole business here. This appears to be the mechanism that kind of coordinates lifting of the this when you tip the display back and I don't know how to untangle that um, I'm, I'm going to try pulling this out despite the fact that there are these sort of melted plastic pegs so you can barely see them here let me get my pointy doodad um, there are these sort of melted plastic pegs here on each side that sort of suggest that maybe it won't pull out, but that may be a part of the top connector piece and it might still work. Yeah, okay. I was overthinking it. Not unusual. Back to the table and we are free. So, victory! Ta-da! Okay. And the battery holder is doing what now? So you can see it's it's still loose, but there's something up on the front end that's holding it in place. So let's turn around. Oh, that thing that's holding it would be a screw. Let's get that out of there. Ta-da! And now look at that. The uh, logic board's all floppy and free. Get the battery holder out of the way. And ta-da! Victory. IBM. Let me put this somewhere else. Need more space for stuff. I guess I can just throw it on the pile over here. I don't think it'll do any harm, but let's go overhead and look more carefully at what we got. Looks like the labels are pretty easily readable. Um, mm, 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 mm. Except all the parts are oriented like this. All of them. That's a weird coincidence. Okay. Well, um, where is the processor? I think that's it right there in the middle. So that, I'm pretty sure, that's got an I, Intel, yep. Um, ADC, 88, yep. And then looks like some um, standard, like, standard bus driver logic, that kind of thing. I need to go full screen on my monitor here so I can see what I'm looking at. Yeah, that's good. Uh, HC373, which I think is an 8-bit latch. 154, I think might be a multiplexer. 245 is very, very common. 8-bit uh, bidirectional buffer. Then we've got what I think might be some static RAM. 14.318 uh, megahertz crystal, which is basically, what, six times the NTSC video color burst frequency, 3.58-ish, 3.579545, blah, blah, blah. Um, this looks like an IBM Custom. 
And same here. Got some more RAM here. This might be might be for video, since this thing's got a certain amount of video capability on board without the additional module. Uh, one of the floppy connectors here is basically like a 40-pin dip footprint, but then it turns into a ribbon cable and goes to the back of the floppy drive here. Then this is whoo, this is the connector that goes to the plug-in module on the back of the computer for expansion. And then back over here, this looks like the floppy controller. Um, 765 I recognize as an NEC floppy controller. Couple more custom ICs, who knows what they do. And second floppy drive connector, uh, 4024, some CMOS logic, I'm guessing, and 4044. And part numbers don't ring a bell, but I'm pretty sure they're CMOS something. 16 megahertz crystal, uh, hex inverter. This over here is where we disconnected the power supply, so that's where the power entry is. Got our serial number, which is still mostly readable, A1308942 Bravo 2 Kilo, and then some, I think just an asterisk. Uh, and then we've got a few more over here. Looks like more RAM, SRM2064. I think this is the same RAM chip that was on the modules. Let me grab a module here. SRM2064. Yeah, okay, so this is a certain amount of SRAM that's probably system memory that's on board. So uh, it's odd that we'd only have three of them. Does that mean there's more on the back side? It doesn't feel like there's chips on the back side. And there's not. It's, it's pretty. It's nice and shiny. But there are no ICs or there's no components of any sort back here. So... Yeah, and then this little stub out here, this is what goes to the expansion memory. Flip it over here. You can see that connector on the other side. So this just goes to the expansion memory. It looks like it's only, what, maybe 50 pins? Which, I mean, I guess for an 8-bit bus computer, you only need 50 pins. Uh, oh, totally missed the... Um, oh, I, I guess I hadn't... I was too busy looking at the camera and didn't realize the depth involved here. These are socketed, and they're probably the BIOS chips. Checking... Oh, um, Esden's found one of the CMOS parts is a seven-stage ripple counter. So probably... Clocking related. It's next to the 16 megahertz crystal and a bunch of hex inverters. I don't know, it could be a free running oscillator or it could be something that's dividing down the 16 megahertz for some reason. Not sure. But yay. Um, I'm still a little perplexed by the RAM though. Um, yeah, where are we? Yeah, so I thought that this system had a certain amount of onboard RAM, but given that these 128K modules have 16 of these parts on them, and that's only three of them, I don't know what those do. They, those might be for video, because I guess earlier when I was looking at the two large dips that it turns out are socketed, I was thinking that those might be for video RAM, but these are more likely going to be video RAM for whatever video hardware this implements, which is probably CGA or EGA or something fairly old. So cool. Um, <clears throat> we've made quite a mess. Um, trying to get back to... Oh, that's right. I'm not monitoring. There we go. Yeah, hopefully you were seeing the overhead view at all the time I was monkeying around. Um... I, I switched away from my monitor view here and wasn't sure what was going out. Cool. Okay. So, um, this is taking up a lot of space. And moving on to the next thing. I don't know, should I put it, see how quickly I can put it back together without breaking anything? Because it's pretty clean. I don't think I really need to, to do any cleaning on it. Um, 
Shall we just reassemble it? Speed run? <laughs> yeah, okay. So let's see. We start with the base. It's all about that base. Jenny was telling me something about what, who did all about that base? Can't remember. Well, that's a little crud hanging around. But first things first, we drop this thing in. Um, mindful that we get this bit here properly into the little channel here. Um, was there some other catch here? This came off. I think the board was the last thing that came off, right? So we should be able to just put this back in and clip it down. This feels good. Feels like it's properly seated. Good. And then I think it was this piece, the battery compartment, which, I mean, ideally I would clean this out, but it really looks pretty clean as is. So screw it. And we had the one screw on the front here, which will go always do the Fran Blanche method. Back out a little bit till you feel the click when you're driving plastic screws back in place and then start screwing it back in. Uh, and that way you won't double thread the hole. All right. I guess I'm stealing something from Adrian. Who else? I'm sure other people do this too, but... Um, then what parts do we have laying around? We have the top piece, which requires us to slot in the display ribbon. So I guess it would have been a better view from over here. So yeah, let me just kind of drop this down. Uh, okay, first things first, I think we have to get the these into their little channels, so like that. And then we can push the floppy cables into their spots. I don't know if it's best to come up from the bottom, like that's the way I pulled them out. Or... Uh, okay. <laughs> Different order of operations here. I was going to try putting this in here and then pushing these in, but these won't push it. I think they have to come in from the bottom because there are these uh, tabs, which would prevent them from being pushed from the back of the computer to the front. So I will push these up from the bottom the same way I took them out. And please, tabs don't break on me. And that's in. Cool. Now the other one. Yeah. From the bottom up, being mindful that there is that tab which is going to get in the way if you seat the cable too far back relative to the top piece. Uh, it's not cooperating. Okay, back out. Back out. There we go. That seems to be incorrectly as well. And then we we'll go and seat these tabs into the case. Although I seem to have pushed this down too far. Now it's not, what's going on here? Uh, what have I done? Oh, I've pushed this down onto these columns. And I think there's some kind of retaining clip. Remember when I said I was pulling this up and it sort of popped apart all of a sudden and I heard a, a snap, but it wasn't a bad snap. I think I have re-snapped that, whatever that was. And so now I need to somehow get it loose in order to get those tabs at the back reseated. And I have no idea how I did that. So maybe I just, no, because I, I need to get this apart because Otherwise, I can't get this cable plug back in. So, Ace of Base. Yeah, I heard something bad about Ace of Base, like they were kind of an evil band or something. Um, not a particularly fun topic for a, a live stream of retro computer stuff, but uh, yeah, just something I heard and found confusing. 
Um, anyway, how do I get this apart? What was the magic that I did last time? I just, I feel like I kind of moved it around and it just kind of came undone. And I remember it being... Uh, well, it came apart, but it did not feel good doing it. Um, I didn't break anything, but it just feels more aggressive than I like. Anyway, let's get this cable plugged in. Um, it's the back of the two connectors that are on the logic board here. Mm. Ta-da! So that's good. And I'll just leave that. Oh, another thing I should probably do before pushing this down is get the um, speaker plug back in back there. So um, I don't know that orientation... Oh, it does matter. So the contacts are on one side of this connector, and I think the copper that you want these to contact is on the top side of the board. So this would be upside down. That would be right side up, plugging it in. So I'm going to go and plug that in back here. Voila. And now at the back side, the uh, floppy drive ribbons are still plugged in. Good. Oh, and by dumb luck, these are in the right place. The um, These tabs on the top piece are seated into the little half round um, cups on the, the base plastic here. Yeah, see, see that? So um, I think that's good. <laughs> Okay, what's next? I think we have three screws that go into the battery case. That's right. Okay, so there's a screw here, a screw here, and another one around the back here. So, uh, that's a little odd. Oh, so, however, before I do that, the battery case does seem to go underneath a little tab here. So I had to push that down to get it in. Otherwise, it was kind of sitting proud and looked kind of sloppy. It wasn't really down against the board. So that's pushed down now. And in with the screws. Click and drive. Uh, no click. Well, just try to be sensitive about it. That feels good. Cool. And then the third one around the back here. There we go. Nope. Yep, there we go. Okay. Cool. And looking at the parts we have left, um, I think we plugged the power supply in next? I think so, yeah. Despite all the struggle getting the thing apart, it really isn't that complicated. You just have to know what the tricks are. Presumably they documented it somewhere. So power supply is in, and then I think we can put the back plate on? Yeah. So back plate. It looks a little, I guess it's because it's just popped up. It looks a little bit sloppy. Like this, I feel like this edge was a little bit cleaner, more even before. But maybe that's just because I haven't really seated this closed yet. So the four machine screws go into the brackets here. Hour and a half. Wow. that needs to be oh all about the bases and well okay <laughs> I thought it was I mean it, it would be poetic wouldn't it but yeah it also seems a little bit too good to be true uh, I think there's a metal rod that needs to be slotted front to back uh, uh, I don't remember what you're talking about um, am I, by putting the back on here I've I've sort of 
probably blocked us from looking at whatever it is you're thinking about. Let me take this off really quickly and you can try. Oh, never mind. You got it. Okay, cool. Right on. Uh, I have my stream set in low latency mode, so hopefully um, it seems like responses back and forth seem to go pretty quickly. Like I read something and then somebody responds back. It's cool. Uh, Ace of Base, which I never understood. It, also, it was... <laughs> yeah, this all sounds too complicated for me. I, I was just lamenting. I think that was a 90s thing, right? I feel like 90, the 90s... Although I guess it's going through a music resurgence now, like it's getting popular again. I don't remember there being a whole lot of redeeming qualities to 90s music by and large. Uh, I mean, there was the grunge thing, and that was fun and loud and angry. And I like loud and angry. <laughs> I'm not a loud and angry person, but I like loud and angry music, which is odd. Um, okay, so now we're at the front. And I think it's just a matter of plugging in the RAM expansions. So, and I presume they're all equivalent. Like there's, I don't know what order I took them out in, but I don't think they have to go back in any particular order either. Um, let's go overhead for this. Because that seems to make nice pictures. Yeah. Okay, so good old RAM expansion here. Come on, camera, focus up. You can do it. Sometimes I have to help it. Oh, I see. Maybe I need to change the way the autofocus works on this thing, because it's just looking at that one little square, I guess. And if there's no detail in that square, then it can't really figure out whether it's in focus or not. Okay. Or I could just get used to hitting the focus button whenever I want uh, things to be clear, which seems like a lot of effort. Okay. Now I have to push down against this really unyielding plastic, and I don't like the feel of this either. Oof. Didn't break it. But some miracle. Cool. There's one in. No broken plastic yet. Hey, I'm starting to get used to doing stuff upside down. I actually pushed that the right way the first time. Second one slotted in. So if this Logic board does not have any RAM on board. That means that the system can only max out at 512K because each of these is 128 and you can get four of them in. But I do recall seeing some discussion of people basically adding a ribbon cable from the last one of these in the chain and then chaining in one more so they can get the full 640, I guess it is. 512 plus 128, 640, isn't it? Yeah because 640 should be enough for anyone. Oh, I hate this bendy plastic stuff. Come on, cooperate, please. Yes, okay, that's number two in. Well, hello, Farhan. Uh, I don't think Esden's going to stream until Tuesday, although he did um, he did skip last week because he was really busy with stuff. But he's here now, so he can tell you, he can give you his excuses. I'm not one to actually call anybody. I'm not streaming because obviously I don't do it very often. Um, I'm trying to get used to the idea. I just, I don't know, I've always been sort of the one behind the scenes of... Uh, doing stuff with bands and all that. And I'm not used to being the one who's actually doing the talking or doing the performance or whatever, whatever this is. <laughs> so I've always feel like kind of odd thinking that I'm going to go and do this. And then of course there's also this, you know, concerns about like, am I prepared? Am I ready for this? What, what's going to go wrong? Overthinking it basically which is definitely something I am very good at. Oh, well, thank you. Um, I'm not even using my good mic. Uh, here. Mute, mute, mute. Yeah, this is how I would like to sound, but this is the boom microphone, and it's not practical to work with this thing while I'm um, working on a computer. Anyway, back to the boring, bland mic. Uh, okay, so where are we now? Ch -ch 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 -
So we got all our memory modules back in, 512K. And I think we got four screws here. What did those four screws go to? <laughs> um, right, those are for the floppy drives. Okay. So floppy drive, number one. I kept track of the left one and we'll put it back in the left slot. Chunk. Uh, and then the right one, junk. And I was reading online, people saying very emphatically not to over tighten these screws because they'll crack the plastic. And I don't, I've gotten all this way and I haven't cracked any plastic that I'm aware of. And I don't want to start now. So these don't have to be particularly tight anyway. Um, they just kind of have to deal with Honestly, I don't know what force they have to deal with because all you're doing is you're pushing floppies in and then you're pushing the button to get the floppy back out again. So you're always pushing. These are really just to keep the drives from falling out. And the way it felt pushing them in, I don't think they're going to fall out anytime soon. So I have no problem being gentle here. Yep, just a nice gentle tug on the screwdriver. And then... Chunk. I still feel a little bit weird going in even with the back out thread trick. Last screw. All right, and now we plug the keyboard in, which this shouldn't be loose like this. I think if I just, well, let's take advantage of this because I still have to plug in the keyboard ribbon. Um, if I push this down and get it latched, um, how it's supposed to be, then it may be too narrow to get the keyboard ribbon back in there. So let's get this guy in. Just sort of very gently moving it around, not pushing down, but just kind of hoping to feel here, here's an idea. This thing's long enough, I should probably just put the keyboard back like this. Eh, that's a little, maybe a little long. Okay, fine. I thought that was a good plan, but maybe not. Hold the keyboard up here, and yeah, just kind of bounce it around until it kind of gets where it needs to be. Ugh, this is awkward. I suppose I could have done this much earlier, but then I would have had it, the keyboard in the way for everything else I was doing. There we go. Boom. We are in. And then I think we can drop the keyboard down. Again, this is probably a good thing that I didn't push this top piece down and get it latched in until I dropped the keyboard in underneath it, because otherwise I would have had a problem. Okay. So I think the keyboard, yeah, okay, so keyboard is supposed to sit, this top edge here of the keyboard is supposed to sit on these tabs here. Hopefully I didn't go too far. Yeah, I should be able to just pull this up and then drop everything down. And then I think with just a little shove, this will click. Or maybe not. Maybe I have to back out something here because I think, yeah, this is not supposed to flop around like this. Um, I think there's some pegs in the back here that this top piece guides on. And I don't think I got those seated. And I'm kind of tugging at it a little bit, trying to see if I can't get this to drop, and it's not going to. And I think pushing down is not a good idea either. Yeah. I don't want to push any harder than that. Okay, so I may have to back stuff up a bit. <laughs> Anxiety-inducing visions, realizing that I should have clicked it in before putting the hinge in place, resulting in the full disassembly again. Yeah, um, rod peg thing. I think we're okay with the rod peg thing back here, but you're probably... I mean, it's clearly something else, so you saw something that I didn't. And let's pull the keyboard off. <laughs> No! 
Okay, yeah, these, I don't know if you got a good view of this last time, but there are these little, let's zoom in, Whee! these little um, kind of, these bits that kind of curve out here, and you can just kind of catch it under your finger on both sides. Oof, can't see that, but yeah, whatever. And it just kind of wiggle it back and forth here and make sure the keyboard pops out. Okay, so yeah, there is a channel. You can probably see it right, just the beginning of it right here, but there's a channel that goes back. And I'm pretty sure there is a peg of something here that needs to be slotted into that. And that was probably when I was talking about pulling this up and it coming loose, I was probably pulling something out of that channel. I just don't know what. Because I can't see it. Um, oh, it's probably that black thing. You know, remember that sort of black yolk-like thing that was inside this plastic? Uh, where's the service manual when you need one? Um, there probably is one. And I... I'll admit I didn't spend a lot of time looking for the docks on this thing, figuring it would come apart more easily than this, but I should have known better. Um, I feel like pulling the floppy drives out might be a good idea. If nothing else, they lighten up working with this piece, so I'm not putting as much force into manipulating this piece, trying to you know, deal with the, the inertia of these big honking drives. So it'll make, it'll be easier for me to be gentle with it if I don't have nearly as much weight um, that I'm working on. So let's pull these back out. Oh, this has got a, um, there's something rattling. Maybe it's just the mechanism. Maybe that's okay. I was just hearing some Something that sounded kind of loose. Ah, okay. Right. Now, <laughs> what is going on here? Where is that yolk? Where? Okay, there is a black... What I feel... What I'm recalling from the other side is there's sort of this black beam and some sort of a, a Y that kind of comes out from it. And to some extent, the position of this is affected by it. I wonder, oh, pfft, hang on. So when I bent this down, this dropped down just fine. There wasn't anything impeding it. And what do you want to bet if I pull this up? No, I think it's riding on top of the slot. Where is the... <laughs> I thought for a second I'd just hit on something that would have been an easy way to get it slotted back in. So this is still behaving the way it should, but I think it's riding on top of that slot, not in the slot, because this shouldn't happen. So, and I can't get eyes on it, so <laughs> this is being difficult. Um, do I take off the back panel and pull out the power supply? would literally take me 30 seconds. Why not? Okay. Uh, reverse speed run. Speed, speed run squared. What happens when you're redoing, undoing, redoing something? This stream may just become taking apart and putting the putting together the 5140. There's other stuff here that should be a lot easier to take apart and put together if everybody's got the energy for it once we finally figure this blasted thing out. Okay, so that panel's off. Power supply's out. Look at me, I'm a IBM technician. Okay. Now on the back side, I'm peering in, and yes, I do see that black rod extending to either side of that center channel on top of the um, the channel that it should be in. And the channel is blocked on the side closer to me here. So the only way that it's going to get in is on the far side there. And it's in that 
fire position now. So the question then is if I just kind of what what is it how is this retained? I've forgotten. Oh, it's retained primarily by these, right? So if I just lift these out, then I look and see can I get the black rod to slide into place? Yes. And these are back in the channel and we're good to go. Power supply back in. Click. Back panel back on. Screws back in. Sometimes the dread of doing something is worse than actually doing it. I was kind of trying to avoid having to undo and redo this, but once I did, the problem was obvious and the solution was obvious. So sometimes you just have to get over that. Life lessons. At my age, I should have learned that lesson a long time ago. Improving your ET takes repetition. ET? Oh, ET is like speed, a speedrun term. I haven't watched a whole lot of speedruns. Usually only the ones that you send me, Esden. And those are fun, but they're usually playing games that I've never played before, or certainly never gotten any good at. So my ability to understand and appreciate what's happening is, is limited. Anyway, back around to the other side. We are now retained. Haha. -ha. And that means we need to put the floppy drives back in. Chonk. And chonk. When did people say start saying chonk? Feels like it's just been the last few years. But then a lot of times terms take a very long time to make their way to people like me who are so out of it that uh, who knows, Chunk could have been around for decades for all I know. Oh. Okay. Squirrely screw. All right. And the keyboard's going to be a little bit harder to get in because now the um, now that this thing is actually correctly positioned, the amount of space available is less. But it was a lot easier than last time, I guess, because I've, I've had practice. So we rest the top of the keyboard on those pegs on the floppy drives, drop the keyboard in, and I think that's it. Oh, you might want to put the display on too. Which you have to be a little bit careful with. It's easy to sort of plug it in the wrong way. Um, yeah, there we go. And then push that back. And look at that, we got a computer again. Ta-da! Put the battery compartment back on. I'm tempted to power it up, but that means I have to go and rifle through my DC adapter collection, and I probably don't have anything that would work anyway, um, because the current requirements are probably too high. But yeah, now boot it. Um, if you can find documentation on what DC it takes, um, I'm betting it's going to be something like 12 volts and like three amps or something like that. And I do have a brick that'll do roughly that. Um, I suppose I should leave this off. If I'm going to power it up and there's any risk of damage, uh, I mean, ideally I would have taken the RAM out too and powered it up with minimum RAM and just seen if it responded to minimize the amount of hardware that was at risk if the, say, the power supply was broken. So let me put this module aside. And then, so I have a bench supply, but it's not here. Um, I have another, um, oh dear, 
I didn't switch my microphones back. Or no, no, I guess I did. Getting used to how my new setup here. Um, let me go back over to the computer, which is here. And see if we can't find a document on the 5140. I suppose it could be in Wikipedia. Do we dare trust Wikipedia? Oh, 15 volts DC, 2.7 amps. Uh, yeah, so I, I have a bench set power supply, but it's in the office. And so it's not here. <laughs> um, I think we're going to have to punt on that. Um, I do have some 15 volt supplies laying around that I bought for Apple II C's because they use 15 ish volts, I think DC. And I might have one that I have not wired up with the Apple II C connector yet. Um, but that would also be at the office. So we're, I think we're kind of stuck here for the moment. Um, but hey, that's for another stream. Who knows um, if. Sunday afternoon, my time, works out for people. If it seems like a lot of people are able to attend and enjoy it, uh, I might make this a thing. I really do need to get to the point where I'm scheduling these instead of just doing them off the cuff when I'm in the mood. Um, because the way my brain works, schedules are good. That means I might actually do it. So, yeah. Anyway, um, let's move on to the next thing. And maybe we'll do a, a viewer vote. Um, let me switch back over to the table so you can see what I'm doing. Nothing too interesting, just putting the video adapter on the back here. Chunk. And we'll put this away. Urgh. Old man noises. Uh, so... We have some more modern stuff. Um, well, okay, we also have this 300 baud modem that I picked up at the same time. It's very 1970s, although I think it might actually be an early 80s product. But yeah, for those of you not familiar with modems, I suspect most of the people I've seen so far know about modems. <laughs> um, back in the day, we used phone lines to for to use to for commuter, computers to communicate and they modulated signals slow enough that you could actually hear them um, you know wi-fi signals now are many megahertz wide and our hearing is only 20 kilohertz wide so there's no possible way that you could turn a wi-fi signal into audio at the rate that it normally happens and be able to hear it but at 300 baud you could totally hear it in fact it was designed to go over a voice telephone line. So by very definition, you could hear it because it was using a technology that was intended for acoustic use, for, for voice and ears and all that stuff. So this um, is a 300 baud modem, but it does not plug directly into the wall. The, I think part of the problem, part of the reason why there were acoustic couplers back in the day is that the bell system in the United States was really weird about letting people plug equipment that they did not design and sell into their system. So this was basically a hack around that. You would have your phone and you would take your handset and you'd just jam it in there. And now you've got a modem. Um, but it doesn't attach electrically to the phone system. It's acoustically coupled, hence the name acoustic coupler, uh, to the telephone, and then the telephone that Ma Bell sold you is connected to their phone system. And it kind of allows you to get around the issues of uh, whether Ma Bell wants you to plug in your own electronic device into their system or not. Um, yeah. These rubber, this rubber is pretty old, so it's very difficult to get this in and out. But uh, I was curious to see what's inside. Um, I'm pretty sure this is going to be almost purely analog electronics. Okay, so we've got four screws, and hopefully <laughs> that's about it. Um, it'll be way easier than dealing with the IBM.
one. You can tell I'm very practiced at taking stuff apart. I've got my, my uh, speed screwdriver technique. Oh, that's weird. It's kind of riding up on the screw on that, that hole. Okay, well, what do we got? Um, that is definitely complex, but I imagine it's almost purely analog. Um, let's get, it, get a nice overhead view while we're at it. I might have to roll the camera up a bit so that we can get the whole thing in view. Yeah. Just um, bear with me a second here while we slide this up a bit. I've got this nice macro lens, but as far as I can tell, well, I just don't know how to use it. I don't know how to zoom in and zoom out with it. <laughs> so I just kind of use the tripod for that. So there we go. That's the back side squared up. And now let's have a look. The, um, there's a switch over here which goes through this bezel, and so I have to pull it back in order to get it around the switch. And, oop, there we go. Yeah, this is totally analog. So, I guess the board's really the interesting thing. I mean, the acoustic coupler is cool too, but um, I gotta think upside down again. Okay, so let me switch to a larger view on my monitor here so I can see what you're seeing and go through it. And also hit the focus button because it looks like it could be a little bit clearer. Yeah. And a couple of these are washed out a little bit, but I'll read them to you. Uh-oh, battery on my camera's getting low. Uh, we may be toast for the overhead view here shortly, so I'll try and do this quickly. Um... We've got some CMOS chips, uh, 14081, 4075. Uh, I know what that chip is, we'll get to that in a minute. Um, 14050, which I remember being a, some sort of a MUX. Um, these are a little hard to read. You can look at the top of my head. 14011, um, 4069, 4081, 401038, that's a lot of numbers. Usually they're four or five digits, huh? That's probably an op amp, MC something, MC hammer. Uh, oh, MC 1450, I've heard of that. I don't remember what it is, but that is a familiar part number. And then this guy, uh, I think another 1450. I need a little bit more light on here. Let's do this. Is that better? That's better, yes. And we'll focus up one more time. Yeah, way better. Okay. It'll probably blow out my, my face, but eh. So this um, XR chip, I think, is an FSK modulator, demodulator, one of the two, possibly both. So that's that's kind of the, the real magic there. And then the rest of the CMOS stuff, I'm not entirely sure what it would have been used for. Uh, it'd be really interesting to try and find a schematic for it. But certainly there are some filters that are implemented here for the high and the low, or the mark and the space codes. Um, and that all gets driven out the serial port here. And then there's some line status of some sort. Um, although, because it doesn't hook up to the line, it's not gonna do like uh, off hook detection or anything like that. There's no way it can do that through an acoustic coupler. Um, these LEDs, uh, oh, actually, okay. Yeah, one LED, I think this one is transmit, receive, carrier detect. So that's if it's detecting, I think a mark, maybe. Uh, I think the high, higher tone. This is a Bell 103 modem, so whatever the Bell 103 spec says. And then this is TS. I'm not sure what TS is. 
Uh, and then we've got a switch here, which is full duplex, test, and half duplex, and another switch that is originate, off, or answer. So the different ways that the modem can, can behave when making a call or receiving a call. Um, I think that changes which modem starts transmitting first. I, 300 baud I kind of missed the boat on. I did, my first modem was uh, 1200 baud. So the fact that you had to go and select originate or answer was something I didn't have to deal with because newer modems were capable of working that out between them. So yeah, this is the inside of a 300 baud modem. Um, I hope to actually hook it up to a computer sometime soon. And again, we have a power issue. I don't have a power brick for this and I don't know exactly what it'll, it'll take. It is a barrel. So if it takes a standard voltage at a reasonable amount of current, I probably have something that will work, but I'm not gonna go look for it right now. We'll save that for another stream. So let me put this back together. Uh, alternate universe would be complaining that we can't buy RCA parts due to chip shortage. Uh, yes, my camera is running out of battery. And we'll switch back over to um, this, this guy and put this thing back together really quick. Yay, four screws. I can do this. Okay, so, oh, let's look at the acoustic coupler really quickly, just for fun. Um, I don't know there's really a whole lot to say about it, other than, you know, one is basically a microphone, and the other is a speaker. Um, and exactly what's embedded in this rubber, what, what exactly it looks like, I'm not going to dig it out and find out, because this is probably one of the... This is probably the best shape I've ever seen in acoustic coupler, because usually the, the rubber rots. And then you wind up with something that's kind of useless because every time you try to use it, it just breaks apart. But this thing, this is in really good shape and I don't want to bust it up. So we're not going to do that. Um, maybe if I find another one that's, that is busted up, we can have a look inside. But again, you know, it's basically a speaker and a microphone. Oh, I have to put the bottom case on first. There I go, off like a shot. I think this is symmetrical, so I don't think it matters what the orientation is. Just drop it on here. Make sure everything's sticking out through the holes the right way. Yep, good, good. And we'll put screws back in. These are machine screws, so I, technically I don't need to do the running them out and then back in again to make sure I've caught the thread correctly. but. It's become a habit at this point, and I think a good habit. And I'm just putting them in a little bit loosely the first time, and then I'm going to jiggle the bottom of the case, and make sure everything's seated, and then tighten them up. Being gentle, because again, this is old, old, old plastic, and I don't want to crack it. All right. One 300 baud acoustic coupler. Now, I could keep going on the retro stuff. I've got that Compact Portable 3, which I said would make a terrible mess when we dig into it. And it's super complicated and unpleasant, <laughs> honestly. Um, and I guess I'm, I'm getting a little bit tired at two hours and nine minutes, or two hours and three minutes, I guess. Um, I have a software-defined radio that I got recently that I'd like to open up and just take a quick look at. And then I also have these IKEA Vindrichtning, uh, word, unpronounceable word for me, the English speaker. These are air quality monitors, and there have been people online who have been hacking these things, basically finding uh, a serial port that outputs the data from the air quality monitor as it operates. Normally, as these things are designed and intended, you plug in a USB-C power supply and they just power up and they show one of three different colors on this little translucent bar here. There's um, three LEDs, red, yellow, and green. And those represent air quality by some, you know, by some thresholds that IKEA determined would be reasonable. But, 
there is a serial port on these that reports the more information than just the red, yellow, and green. So I see people asking about the SDR. Hmm. Well, you can do that too. This is the SDR. So yeah, this came from China. It's a company called Microphase. And what they're doing is basically making um, a version of the analog devices doodad that they came out with a few years ago. I'm just getting it out of the out of the bin here. Not the bin bin, not the rubbish bin, the uh, bin of software-defined radio junk that I have. Uh, this is the Adelm Pluto, another unpronounceable thing. And it's a software-defined radio that is a... Um, well, the overhead camera still working. Yeah, so this is an Adelm Pluto from Analog Devices. It is a single-chip software-defined radio transceiver. Um, I think it's AD 9361 or 9363. I'm not sure which, which of the two ships in this one. But that chip is basically an entire software-defined radio on a chip. And then they connected it to an FPGA. I think it's a uh, Xilinx Zinc. So it's got a little ARM processor in there, uh, like a Cortex-A9, I think. And a USB port. And now you've got a completely self-contained software-defined radio that can run real software. Like it's not a, a deeply embedded software-defined radio like the HackRF, where you've got 200K and a 200 megahertz processor. You've got a pretty big FPGA and a, an application class Cortex processor in there. So you can do some really serious stuff. I got this a few years ago, think, hoping that maybe I would do some really serious stuff with it, and I haven't. But um, it has a, a couple of limitations, one of which is that the chip on here actually has a second receiver and transmitter on it, but analog devices didn't pin it out. And I think to some extent it may be to kind of not compete with their customers that are also making software-defined radios that are much more expensive using the same chip. Um, Edis Research comes to mind. They make the... Um, B200 series that is kind of similar to this, but more intended to hook up only to a PC. Um, so this is cool and it's relatively inexpensive. I think they're 200 and something dollars, whereas Edis stuff is, you know, like seven, eight hundred dollars to start. Um, it's really nice, but this is pretty nice too and a lot, a lot cheaper. This, however, is like the Adelm Pluto, except they pinned out both of the receiver and transmitters in the, um, the wireless transceiver IC. So I got one. Um, it's a little bit more expensive than the Adelm Pluto. I hate saying that, Adelm Pluto. Uh, I think it's $3.99, and then you can, of course, buy accessories. Um, I got a few of the accessories. So um, Ethernet cable, yes. Unlike the Adelm Pluto, this has an Ethernet port. So you can move a gigabit worth of data out of it instead of the USB 2 high speed port that's on the Adelm Pluto, which theoretically will get you 480 megabits, but in reality will only get you 400 megabits on a good day. So yeah, it's pretty cool. Um, and you can, I'm pretty sure the SD card and the software that comes with it just boots into Linux and you can do all sorts of stuff with it. So I'm looking forward to playing with it. But first, let's take it apart. Uh, it looks like it's just four screws on the front. Since this thing is small enough, I should probably zoom in a bit. I need a target on my table so I know where to keep stuff when I'm taking things apart. Now, I know better than this. Uh, of course, you're going to need to loosen all of these uh, SMA connector nuts, but whatever. It'll all work out in the end. I suppose I could have taken it apart from the other end. Yeah. Yeah. 
This is good. Do to do to do. By happy coincidence, it appears that my camera view shows me facing the thing I'm working on, even though I'm facing to my right. It all works out. Okay, and now, oh, hey, I didn't even have to pull these off. Again, I didn't think about the implications. Um, and I was also sort of biased by all of my work with the HackRF, where the... Um, these have to come off in order to get the case on and off, either with the standard HackRF case, where they're just kind of in the way if you don't take them off, and on the porta pack where you pretty much have to take them off because at least a couple of them thread through the case. But anyway, yeah, I would pull it out, and it's a shame that my overhead camera battery died, but that's what we got. Um, yeah, so it's got a zinc. Uh, XC7, my glasses aren't helping me enough. Um, I'll go look real quick. ZC, or sorry, XC7, let's try this again. XC7Z020, um, CLG400. I don't know what the grade of the FPGA is but it's also got some RAM on there. And then this is the transceiver chip here. Uh, the analog device is AD9363, which I think is the lowest grade of part. Um, Microphase does sell a 9361 variant, which I think does a much higher sampling rate. With only a gigabit ethernet port as IO, there may not be a whole lot of point to having that much more bandwidth than, than this base unit does. So take that for what that's worth. Um, we've got, let me get my pointy stick, got a gigabit ethernet phi here, and then I'm guessing this is gonna be like an FTDI chip. I think I can make out FTDI on there. And that might be a ULPI USB phi if I take this away really quickly and look. Oh. Uh, I think it might be an SMC chip, and I'm almost sure that it's a USB 2.0 Phi, like that will do high speed probably. But yeah, here you can see we've got four SMAs total, and two of them are going to be receives, and two of them are going to be transmits, and then we've got balance, balanced unbalanced transformers that bring each of those four signals into the IC. Uh, I don't know whether the balans are tuned for a specific range of frequencies or whether they're as wide as the bandwidth or the tuning range of the, the chip. Uh, another thing I'll have to look up. But uh, my, my intent behind getting this was to take a radio setup that I've got over back behind me there that is basically like a public service radio monitoring system. Um, I'm monitoring 700 and 800 megahertz radio channels of the local government you know so the city the state or, well the city that in the county have a radio system that they use to communicate and i've just been basically using that to using the system to record all of this stuff and log it just because i would like to make it available to the public in order to see what the people who work for us are doing on a daily basis um, and I'd like to condense all of that down into a single unit like this and maybe put it up in my attic instead of having it here in my, my office at home, taking up a lot of space. Since this has got two channels receive and two channels transmit, I won't need the transmit part, but the, the two channels of receive can be tuned to the 700 megahertz and 800 megahertz bands that I'm interested in, in separately instead of what I have behind me, which is two hack RFs hooked up to two Raspberry Pis doing all of the stuff that I want to do. So ideally I'd be able to consolidate all of that down onto this one device and maybe publish it so that people around the world, 
certainly in the U.S., can use this as a way to basically monitor public service radios. Um, specifically, I'm working on P25 stuff. And a lot of it's encrypted, and of course you can't, practically speaking, decrypt that stuff. But, um, you know, it, it feels like a, a public service that needs to exist for, for us to be able to hear what the people working for us are doing. End of political rant. I will put this thing back together. Uh, as soon as I get it in the slot. Uh, any questions on that? That was a very mild political rant. True enough. Um, and I think entirely reasonable, but, you know, in today's political climate, you know, you could say the sky is blue and somebody would get very mad at you for saying such a heinous, horrible thing. Lies! So, whatever. Mm. This is probably not the ideal screwdriver for this. I could, should probably get a smaller one. Wee! Yeah, okay. Let me get a smaller one. I happen to have one right here, because I kind of thought this might happen. Yeah. And I'm still <laughs> having a problem with the screw. Okay. Yeah, yeah, we got it. Okay. Is PDX Hackerspace here? Yep. PDX Hackerspace might uh, be aware of people that we know who are already doing some of this um, public service monitoring. And I, I just, I want to get to the point where it's basically productized, where people can, who are interested in this stuff can just buy some reasonably inexpensive widget and set it up and be able to log and share out all that stuff. And there are people that have done some of that work already. Um, Luke Burnt, I think is, is his name, um, who lives in Baltimore, I think, has been working on uh, a monitoring monitoring software, but it it fundamentally, it's, it's really heavy and it requires a lot more hardware than it really should, ideally, which means it's a much more, much larger investment financially in order to set something like that up. And I was assembling behind my my uh, little video thumbnail there. That's better. Not that I'm doing anything all that interesting, just putting screws back in. So, um, obviously I don't actually know a whole lot about this thing other than I know the chip that goes into it, and I'm pretty sure it'll do what I want if I spend enough time working on it. Um, does anybody have any questions about it? Full frontal. Oh yeah, they um, they included some. Oh, wrong one again. I need to make little icons for my video switcher so. That I can just tell by looking which one I want instead of having to read and understand. Um, it did come with some accessories. So you can buy the, the raw board or you can get the nice metal case and it is a nice metal case and a bunch of USB cables and a few cute little antennas and a <laughs> um, USB stick of questionable uh, provenance. Uh, has anyone heard of of this, whatever this is? I mean, it's 512 gigs, which seems pretty ridiculous. But I don't think I'm going to use it. <laughs> all right, so pack all this stuff away. And... How about some Ikea gear, now that I have the small screwdriver out? Um, small screwdriver... Oh, HF radio stuff with that SDR? Is it pure high-frequency stuff? I think it'll tune down pretty low. Um, the, the microphase has gigabit Ethernet, 
It does not have USB 3. USB 3 is a complicated subject. <laughs> so, um, I mean, someday in the distant future, projects like Luna will enable USB 3 on lots of devices. Um, but right now, having USB 3 ship on stuff like these SDRs is not, it's not happening. So we're just going to have to wait or we're going to have to put up with gigabit, gigabit Ethernet. Or I've seen some radios use the approach of having those SFP. There are these basically these little card slots that use um, high speed serial links into an interchangeable module, which can be optical or it can be copper or probably all sorts of other things, too. That seems to be a pretty inexpensive way to get extremely high bandwidth that is dependent upon having an FPGA that's capable of talking that high-speed serial, um, you know, gigabit trans transceivers. So the FPGAs that have that tend not to be all that inexpensive, but the same thing's true of USB 3. You either need to have a 250 mega sample, mega transfer pipe interface to get USB 3.0 speeds, or you need to have gigabit transceivers um, to talk directly USB 3.0, super speed. So it's, we'll get there, we'll get there. Um, the fact that a lot of things have USB 2 high speed nowadays is cool, um, but obviously it can't happen fast enough to get the bandwidth required to do really wide band SDR stuff on USB 3. Okay, so let's take apart the IKEA thing. Have the, maybe I'll move the phone. Ugh. Ding. We only need to take apart one of these. Oh, I suppose I should introduce it properly. Um, anybody know how to pronounce Vindrichning? I don't. But yeah, these, so these are from Ikea. They are air quality monitors. The front bezel here lights up red, yellow, or green, depending upon how filthy your air is. It's powered by a USB-C plug, uh, USB-C power supply and cable. And then these are presumably where air is exchanged through the air quality sensor. And then we've got four screws on the back. And we should be in. And while I'm doing this, I have to think about whether I'm going to be able to deliver on the promise of tapping the signals and getting a serial output from this thing. Because that's the whole point of taking this apart, is that the air quality sensor inside, um, or the microcontroller it's tied up to that changes the LED color, has some sort of a serial interface that you can tap and you can get air quality information. These things at IKEA I think are $12 US, and I don't, it, they haven't caught on like wildfire, like you, the uh, Hacking community hasn't gone wild over them because they're still in stock, last time I checked. Do, 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 do. This is the part where YouTube videos speed things up 5x and make really crazy mouse noises. But here you have to watch me at 1x. And we're free! Okay. Guess we can move the other one out of the way. And what do we have here? We've got the air quality sensor here. And it looks like a three or four conductor cable that goes to this other board, which has got a eight pin SOIC chip on it, which I would presume is going to be a microcontroller. And then oh, that's kind of glary. Yeah, there we go. Then we've got a USB-C connector down at the bottom. And I don't know what that's running to. Oh, that must be to the LED. No, no, the LED is on the front. So the LED must be on the back of this board. I don't know what this is. Oh, maybe, ah, I think the fan that moves air through the sensor is separate from the sensor itself. Yeah, okay. If we tip it up here, you can see this red and black pair runs down to a little muffin fan. Let's get this a little bit closer. You see there's a little muffin fan in there. 
and that must be blowing air through the sensor. Um, yeah, and so th there are two compartments. You've got the bottom compartment with the fan, and there's a, a region that's open on the back here, all these perforations on the back. And then there's a different set of perforations on the top here, where presumably the air is exiting the sensor. And it feels like the sort of dark circle. I don't know if you can see it real well on the camera. The light at this angle is not great. Let me tip this down and blow myself out even more. Yeah, look at that. Woo! Um, might be able to see a little black circle there. I think that is the outlet of the air quality sensor. Tip this back up so I'm not completely blown out. I really do need to get a better lighting setup. Just totally blown out. Screw it. Okay, so I want to ID this chip. I'm going to stare at it real quick. Thankfully, it did not sand off the uh, part number or anything. Uh, I'm having a hard time reading that. There are words. But I can't tell what they say. But honestly, for just messing around with it, it doesn't matter because... Zoom in here a little bit. Focus up. Come on. Nope. That's good enough. Okay. You will see that there's a bunch of test points and they're all very nicely labeled. And also, by the way, there are people who are doing this on the internet already, uh, taking these things apart and making them produce data. Um, so if you go and search online, you will find lots of people. I, I'm not, <laughs> I'm not doing anything novel here. I just, I got a couple of these and thought I would share what people are doing with these and maybe try and do it myself. So these look like the LED, yeah, LED G, LED R fan, PWM fan. Oh yeah. So when you plug this thing in, you can hear the fan changing speed. So there's definitely some PWMing going on. And then here, um, kind of ISP reset, some clock signal, and uh, it gets kind of mushy. Oh, ground, it's up there, and 5 volts. And then there's a few other things that almost look like it, it was intended to be a connector for some other application that's just not populated. Ground five volts, clock. Yeah, I guess it's the same four, five signals all, all over again. Um, oh, do I pull out my soldering iron and wire this up? I should probably do that. Um, my soldering setup here at home sucks though. I don't know, maybe we'll, maybe we'll just poke at it. I've got my oscilloscope here and we can see signals coming out of it. I will need to set it up, which means crawling underneath the table. And let's see, do I want to use... The problem is I got too many choices here. I got my oscilloscope, which unfortunately won't decode anything that we capture. Um, and then I've got my logic analyzer, which will decode, but it's not got nice pointy probes on it. So... And I'm trying to think if I've got any really tidy little rework wire. The problem with actual hacks, hardware hacks, is that all of the good stuff is in the office. And... Blah. Let me look around for some decent hookup wire. Ordinarily, I would use, like, 30-gauge... Uh, hi, everybody. 30-gauge... <clears throat> Uh, wire wrap wire, but I'm pretty sure all that stuff is also at the office. Well, there's a logic analyzer. Pull that out, and wire, wire, wire. I've got some boxes of random in here that might have just some wire I can appropriate. Uh, nothing in there is looking good. Oops. Yeah. I got too many projects. Enough projects that I can't actually move around this 
room without knocking some of them over. Ah, I can steal some wire off, wire off of here. I'm not liable, liable to use this. Two, two, two. Where are we for time? Two and a half hours. Oh, or there's some just random wire bits in here too. Cool. Okay. So this is my box of crap. Zoom out. This is just some random stuff I've been intending to get rid of or that I don't know what to do with. Um, the back panel of something <laughs> that I don't know where it goes, but I'm holding on to it for when I do figure out where it goes. Um, EEPROM from upgrading a friend's sampling, music sampling doodad back in college, which would have been tw more than 25 years ago. Um, cassette adapter, anyone? Okay, so I've got some wire bits, just long enough to extend the edge. I think what we'll do is we'll, we'll tap into this edge connector here. And, oh man, I also haven't soldered without my microscope forever. <laughs> and my eyes are not getting better. So this is going to, I'm going to be doing my Mr. Magoo impersonation. Um, and where's my soldering iron? There it is. Yeah, I just don't do any soldering at home. I've had the soldering iron since I was in high school. It is not my good soldering iron. <laughs> not by any stretch. All right, I'll let that warm up while I figure out what I'm doing. Uh, 300C looks good. And solder sponge. And now how do I strip wire wrap wire? Do I have a tool around here? Yeah, this is a rough scene. Um, so as then you don't have to guess. There are there's a bunch of stuff out there, I guess, with people playing this, playing with this already. So the question is whether we want to cheat and look online and find out what other people have discovered or whether we want to figure it out ourselves. Um, wire cutters also should be in here. And oh, we do have we do have a couple of wire wrapping tools, and one of them feels heavy, like it might have the stripper in it. Yes. Okay. Yeah, so wire wrapping tools, which famously have a detachable top, which holds a wire stripper. Okay, so I think we have all the bits required to solder. Mmm. Solder and iron that hasn't been used in a very long time has a unique smell. That does not look right. The gauge is showing that... Oh, I guess... It's not at 400C. Baloney. No way. I'm going to try and use the solder that's already there. This thing is so far out of calibration. Either it's at 400C or it's at less than 300 but I don't know which. <laughs> It'll all be fine. Okay. Now I have to take my glasses off because that's the only way I can see what I'm doing at these close distances. Okay, so we definitely want ground. E Oof. I 
might want my microscope. I also wouldn't mind some flux. <sighs> yeah, I need... I need something. I do have, I think, a roll of ancient leaded solder back here, too. Oh, wait, we've got a roll of Kester something or other. This is fine. It's also expired, but it'll work. Silver and lead. Oh, wait, Essen and PB? Essen is silver, right? Or is that a, a G? A U A G? I suck at chemistry. Okay, so let's put some good old fresh lead solder on these lead-free pads. And 300C is probably way more than we need for this. Come on, stick. Yeah, that's really dodgy. That's going to pull off. I probably couldn't see what I was doing, although my head was probably in the way anyway. Yeah, that's super dodgy. More solder. I guess I could go for the big pads. It just seems like these are so conveniently located uh, to just come right off the edge of the board. Load up the solder. Okay. That's legit. Okay. And we'll cut that reasonably short and strip the other end. Can you see what I'm doing? I can't see what I'm doing. So that makes two of us. There we go. That's one. Three more to go. All right, back in. That's on there too. They're all the same color. That'll be fine. Although keeping them separate would make it easier when I come to when it comes time to hook them up. Ah. Just trying to strip the other end off here. Yeah. I suppose I could be clever and strip both ends and cut the piece before I soldered it on. Some, for some reason, I feel like it might not be that it might not be easier that way, but we can give it a shot. I think I need a little bit more. And about three, four centimeters long. And solder this. I'm really hoping these are the four signals we want. <laughs> um, I mean, aside from tapping into the sensor itself, these seem like the most obvious candidates. Oof. Yeah, that's not on there really well. I need a little bit more solder on that pad. And the wire is going to fall off when I heat it up, of course. Or maybe it won't. That's unexpected. You're getting mostly my head in the shot. What does that look like? No, it's not too bad.
Okay, last one, and then we can hook up the logic analyzer and see what we get. Oh, I also need to find a USB-C power supply. Um, I think I think I've got something here on the desk that'll do that without problem. Assuming I have a cable that's right, and I don't know, USB-C just seems like such a complicated mess. And then I look over and see if the chat explodes when I say USB-C is a complicated mess. Because I know I am not alone in this opinion. All right, we got four reasonably solid wires on and I can put my glasses back on and see what's gone on in the world since I've been away. Okay, so I need to make room to get over to my computer now. Um, I want to leave the iron on just in case, just for old time's sake. This iron is 35 years old. And I think um, Zytronic still exists because I remember just a few years ago looking for a replacement tip for it before I got my fancy Metcal, which was very much secondhand, very heavily used, but built like a tank. Um, and the company was still around and I actually ordered replacement tips for it, but they changed the design and they don't fit. So I have these tips for a soldering iron I don't own. Okay, so let's get out. Um, yeah, you really can't see what I'm doing, but it's just over the computer. I'm going and unpacking some uh, logic analyzer stuff. Um, test clips. Soleil logic analyzer, which I use mostly because the software is so good. Um, and sometimes you don't want to just fart around with anything but really good software. Other times I don't mind, but sometimes when you just want something that works, <laughs> um, you gotta go. You gotta go for it. So let's get the logic analyzer plugged in. Uh, which computer am I using? The bottom one. Okay, in we go. Oh, do I have the Logic software on? It doesn't take long to download. Okay, so Logic Analyzer plugged in. And yes, I'm filthy. I was just working with lead solder and now I'm handling all of my stuff and I'm gonna type on my keyboard um, I'll get by. I need VCC? <laughs> Los Datos, sick Quake Mouse. I think, I think I know who that is. Hmm. Precious few people would be dropping Quake in the chat right now. There's context. Okay. Um, I still need to get this thing power. So where am I going to run a USB-C cable? Where am I going to get a long enough USB-C cable? Back to the bin. Oh, I need to get some crap out of here. It's too much stuff. Taking up too much space. Yes, this will work. This should be long enough. Yikes, almost melted my cable. Okay, USB-C dock. I'm sure the uh, IKEA product is going to root my laptop when I plug in the USB-C cable. Oh yeah, let's plug in the one that I haven't disassembled and you can see 
what it does when it gets connected. So it cycles through the colors, and then it detects lots and lots of solder flux and lead in the air and turns bright red. Oh, okay. I guess the air quality in here is better than I thought. Why, you got a butt shot? Okay, so we have to hook this up. First, we got a ground. We get out some clips here. Okay, so ground is that one. Got it. Then channel zero will go to whatever that says. I can't tell, but we'll find out what it does. See what it does. So come around. Ugh. I need bifocals. Channel one goes here. Nope. I bent up a couple of these pretty badly. I don't think that one's going to work. I should probably just throw that one out. Although I could probably bend it back into shape. Oof. Kinda not get it on the insulator. Oof. Oh, and the other one fell off. Is this how it's gonna go? <sighs> All right. Now we'll put channel zero back on. All right. <laughs> channel two. And don't the rest of you disconnect while I'm doing this. It looks like they're all going to stay. This looks like blah, blah, blah. It looks like this one's buggered too. Yep. Fine. We'll go to another one. And this one as well. These have been pretty heavily used, and I've not treated them particularly well. Seriously? Seriously. I wish I had my uh, overhead camera. You can buy dummy, they call them dummy batteries, that basically just fit in the battery compartment and then hook up to a, an adapter on the other side and just provides, you know, plentiful power for devices that don't take adapters on their own, but only run from battery. Well, so I've got five of these that don't seem to work well. I was not expecting this to be a problem. Oh, cool, you've got one. I, yeah, I need to get one from the, this is an Olympus, that is the, um, the overhead. So, Esden, you said you looked 
or wait. Yeah, you, you looked up what others had connected. Um, we are connected to the right things after all. <laughs> That's good news. Oh, come on. Seriously? <sighs> Do I have a fresh bag of these? Because these are... These are not happy. Oh, almost three hours. I suppose I could solder headers on the other end. That seems kind of ridiculous, though. All right, starting over. Yes, I'm using what seems like a slightly fresher bag. <laughs> All right, 30 gauge apparently is just not uh, happening. What I could do, I suppose, is tin these with a nice blob of lead solder and make them thick. Uh, if I could actually get them to stick and not fall down onto my table. Ugly hack, but it'll work. And this one doesn't really have a blob on it yet. Mmm, smoke. All right. This should work. Please work. That feels better. All right, channel zero goes here on the blob. And channels one, two. That blob is not all that conveniently located. Are you on there? I think so. All right. Don't breathe. Okay, now over to the computer. And I think I don't have logic on here. Nope, but I know where to get it. Oh, come on, Firefox. Why do you... Ugh. What? Oh, E A E. I'm curious what that name even means. It always trips me up. Download Linux. I'm half off camera. There we go. Okay, say file. And where is it? There it is. Do I have a bin? I do have a bin. And I'm going to be lazy and not open terminal. Look at me. So, logic should be opening now. Maybe I click too fast. What is it doing? Hello? Run, please. There we go. 
And the device is connected, initializing. Good. We want four digital channels. Um, I don't know, 100 milli mega samples per second seems reasonable. 3.3 volts, no analog. Um, I don't, uh, whatever. We'll just set it going. See when it jiggles. Uh, can you all see that? I'm not seeing a fat lot on the display right now. Everything's hooked up right. Try everything. Oh, there we go. There's something. All right. Well, let's zoom in on that then, as soon as I remember how. I think there's a way to basically tell Soleil to just trim everything off screen. Yeah. So all that the gigabytes worth of data I captured, I can just say, send it away. These, I suspect, are noise, because they always seem to happen on the falling edge. Um, oh yeah, and I'm only capturing three channels, right? One, one's just ground, so we can turn off channel four. Um, just channel three, yeah. Okay. So, yeah, what is channel zero? I should label these. That says... I can't read that. It's like ISD clock or ISP clock. And then the second signal. Um, I can't read that. Well, in any case, we can kind of tell that this is probably serial. Let's look at one of these bit times, which is 103.4 microseconds, which is almost 10 kilohertz, which is 9600. Hmm, 9600 baud? Hmm. So let's add a protocol decoder. Um, async serial 9600, channel 1. Probably 8 in 1, sure. And see what we get. That looks like serial. And then we can add another protocol analyzer for the other direction. As soon as I remember how. Yeah. Channel 2. And there we go. And I have no idea what that means. But it's 9600 baud serial. And assuming that I've got the Indian this correct, and I don't know who in today's day and age sends bits in the opposite order that everyone else does, but that looks, you know, we've got a run of zeros here, and I don't know, I mean, usually when you're dealing with a binary protocol, zeros happen. And I think we've got something. Oh, ISP clock rests in ISPDA. Those are the two, the three, signals on the one end of the connector. So I guess it'd be ISP clock rest. I mean, I, looking at the data we're actually seeing, it just seems like bi-directional serial. So yeah, we've got something going on here. Uh, I suppose now is where I'll resort to going to the internet and see Ikea. I can at least spell it. Vindrichtning Serial. Uh, no, not that, but this looks promising. Oh, and there's a whole EEV blog forum thread on it. Yeah, there's a bunch of stuff. So yeah, again, I'm not doing anything novel here, but I just thought it would be fun to mess with because it seems handy, and like eventually hooking it up to an ESP3266 or 8266 or ESP32 would be pretty cool. 
Oh, look, 9600 baud. So they are looking at certain bytes and pulling them out. Receive buffer. I'm guessing that this is an interrogation. So this is probably the microcontroller interrogating the, the sensor. And then this is the response. So let's look at the code here and see if we can sort of map stuff. So they must receive a chunk of bytes and they're looking at the fifth, I guess it'd be the sixth, zero, one, two, three, four, five, fifth and sixth bytes as the PM25. So it's, um, what is that, 33 parts per million of PM2.5. And then they've got num readings, which I don't know where that comes from. Oh, so they turn that, oh, this is history. So they're, they're taking seven data points and averaging them in a very odd, I guess it's not that odd. They just kind of unrolled their loop by adding zero through six and dividing by seven. Okay, fine, you can do that. Um, it's Arduino code. So yeah, I guess I guess the data's in there and that my PM 2.5 is supposed to be 33 parts per million, 21 hex, which seems okay. Uh, we should be able to do another capture here and then set up a trigger so that it only goes after it sees channel one. Um, and we're sampling way faster than we'd need to for 9600 baud. Let's go down to um, one mega sample per second. Sure, no problem. And then we will sample on channel one and we'll wait for it to do, wait for it to fall. And then capture duration afterwards, one second, sure. So we'll just run it, waiting for trigger. And then it should come along and capture one second. That's, that's not enough. Um, I think maybe the trigger doesn't work the way I think it does. Oh, it's five o'clock here. I guess we've, we've just entered the third hour. Um, capture after pattern and channel, other channel conditions, no. Trim pre-trigger data, sure. I don't know why I lost other stuff, but let's make this two seconds. Sure, why not? And go. Oh, that's interesting. That time it did what I expected. Um, but where was, where's the captured data? There it is, okay. So yeah, now this number's changed. Zero, one, two, three, four, five, six. So my PM 2.5 um, is what 1D, so that'd be 29 in decimal. Yeah, um, I think it's working. <laughs> so cool. Um, let's go back to my overview here. And yeah, we, I think, that I think I'm going to wrap it up here because uh, it's been over three hours now and we've taken apart a bunch of stuff and made even a, a few things work. Um, so let's go full screen and I will thank you for hanging out with me today and taking apart stuff and chatting. Um, I think maybe I'll try and schedule something for Sunday afternoon again because this, this felt pretty good and I could go for three hours and no big deal. So let's, let's plan on that. Uh, maybe next Sunday or maybe every other Sunday, we'll see how long it takes for me to recover from this. Cause three hours of yakking constantly and taking stuff apart is, it is work. Um, so we'll, we'll see how I recover. Maybe I'll schedule something for next Sunday, but uh, I appreciate you joining me and chatting and hanging out and uh, hope to see you again soon. Thank you.